Well, the conference is off to an amazing start so far and now here to shed some light on the end game of this HODL mentality that we all know so well is Tim Draper of Draper Gone Home and Michael Saylor of MicroStrategies. Hi, I'm Tim Draper. I'm here with Michael, Michael Saylor uh, from MicroStrategies and we're very happy to be here at the LA Blockchain Summit. Michael, um, the two of us have, have not met before, but it's really great to have you uh, with me on this panel. And we are here to talk about what is the end game. Um, what do you think? Where is it all going to go from here? What do you think? I know we both sort of have <coughs> been very aligned in our thinking, and we'll, we'll see whether that continues. <clears throat> you know, um, I think there's, there's three different phases of, of development for for Bitcoin and the entire the entire cyber economy and the crypto economy that uh, surrounds it, I think the first phase is digital gold. The second stage is digital property, and the final phase is digital energy. And some economists call it digital money, but I'm going to call it digital energy because I'm a technologist and. I think if you look at Bitcoin today, if it's digital gold, I take a billion dollars and I, I create a, a block of virtual gold and I can move it around maybe fast at the speed of light and store it forever and it's better gold than gold. And I think that uh, that, that appeals for macro investors and long-term investors and holders. But I think the more power, and that might get you to 20 trillion worth of market cap. But I think if you start thinking of it as a billion dollar hotel in cyberspace and I had a thousand rooms, then it's digital property. And if I could sell the room nights in 20 different cities every night, then you can start to see the power of digital property. And if I started selling room hours or room minutes and I got the utilization rate up to 10,000% and tripled or quadrupled the rates, then, then you start to see the power of it is property. I can generate yield off of it and I can mortgage it. Unlike gold, you can't generate yield and mortgage gold so easily. So I think that, um, that Bitcoin as digital property opens up an entirely new set of economic opportunities. And that takes you not from 20 trillion, but to 100 to 200 trillion. And then I think the final manifestation is digital energy. At some point, if I'm decomposing the hotel into room minutes and I'm zipping it around every minute to a different part of the world and I can develop on top of it and I can vibrate it and I can build it into every mobile app or any social network and small quanta it, and then I can recompose it. It feels like energy converting to matter and matter converting to energy in a, in a thermodynamically conservative fashion. It's digital energy. And if I think about the world, I think Bitcoin is digital goals worth 20 trillion. Bitcoin is digital properties worth more than 100 trillion. Bitcoin is digital energy is worth 500 trillion. And digital energy is the backhaul. It's, it's like money. I mean, you're using it as the backhaul energy network for all good services and pro property in the universe or in the, in the world. But you could also use it as energy, right? You could you can build it in, you could run a machine, you can build it in a machine or a family or a city or a government or a company, and you can run that thing in theory forever off of that digital energy source. So I, I just think that every year for the next, you know, for our lifetime, you're just going to see more and more applications that build Bitcoin into them. And it's, it's going to transform every sector of the economy. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll answer it. Um, it's very, that's really fun to think about it that way. Um, I look at it as, um, as more geopolitically and anthropologically. Um, the internet opened up the world and allowed us to communicate across border do business across border to um, it change communications, information, gaming, entertainment, media, it changed a bunch of industries. And, uh, and it did start all of us realizing that um, we're all part of one world. Some people knew that before, but it was very difficult to communicate and to travel around the world before the internet came. And, uh, 
And now uh, suddenly there is a vehicle to move goods and services, uh, to move money across border from wherever to wherever. And it is not tied to a political force and it is wide open. And so all that trade uh, that, that goes on around the world uh, will be accelerated and will be, um, and will be captured uh, through Bitcoin. And I, I'll, I'll start with this thinking. Uh, Bitcoin for me represents trust and freedom. It's, it's I, instead of having a third party to trust, having to work with a government and a bank, um, I have this, this uh, uh, set of algorithms decentralized around the world. And I have this, this way of trusting a system that allows me to, to uh, earn and store value. And so um, when I think about um, trust and freedom, um, those are two vehicles for uh, how a country will become valuable. A business will become valuable. Any, any entity becomes valuable if, if it has trust and freedom in it. And Bitcoin represents that trust and freedom to me. Uh, the freedom to trade across border anywhere we want, um, the trust to know that it's not tied to some central government or some um, uh, political whim force. Um, and to sort of prove that trust and freedom work, um, I use uh, North Korea and South Korea were divided after the war by the demilitarized zone. And, uh, and in North Korea, they took away everybody's freedom. They, they made it a socialist Marxist dictatorship. Uh, the government told everybody what to do. Everybody had to follow the government uh, dictates or else. And then South Korea was this free market, open democracy, open border, um, capitalistic society. And 70 years later, we're looking and we see South Korea um, um, the average South Korean makes 460 times what the average North Korean makes, even with purchasing power adjusted. And the average South Korean is now four inches taller than the average North Korean. So clearly freedom really worked up there. Trust, I always think of Singapore. Singapore is the least trusted country uh, 70 years ago. It was... Um, it was where the Singapore sling was and all sorts of trouble. And it was also the poorest country in the world or one of the three or four poorest countries in the world. And Lee Kuan Yew put in trust. He built trust in Singapore and Singaporeans. They were trusting, they were trustworthy and they were trusted. And, and now 70 years later, that trust has made them one of the richest countries in the world. So now we have a new vehicle for freedom and trust. Now, to, to give you an example of, of how this is gonna affect the world economy, if I'm in an African country right now, many of the African countries, um, I look and not only do I lose money via the government, just the central banks spending money and uh, devaluing the currency I've got, but I also, am not, um, I'm in a position where if I build something of value, it just, it's just taken away from me through uh, either through force or through inflation. And suddenly I have a currency now in Bitcoin that is um, not only trusted, not only free, but everyone knows there are only 21 million of them. And that uh, limits uh, the ability for anyone to change that. And so as an entrepreneur, if I'm in Africa, I can build something of value. And if I store it in Bitcoin, I know it's there. <clears throat> I know it's not going to be taken away by some government. So, <clears throat> so I'm kind of thinking that if you take this to the future, we end up being all one world. Uh, the geographic borders become almost meaningless. Governance becomes a competitive thing where people can move and 
They can move their money, they can move their, their bodies, they can uh, move from country to country, and the governance uh, that is provided is going to have to compete for us. And if that's the case, then, uh, then a, a global currency makes perfect sense. Um, in addition, there's another statistic I heard, and that is that only one in 14 Bitcoin wallets a year ago uh, was owned by a woman. And uh, women control about 80% of retail spending. And you put those two things together and you realize that those two things haven't come together. Uh, once they do, uh, we are going to see a, a big boom in the, the need for, uh, for Bitcoin because all the retailers are sitting there saying, um, hey, look, I can save two and a half to 4% every time you swipe your credit card if you just use Bitcoin. And then the buyers will say, oh, I can, you know, I get a little savings and it's more convenient and my retailer likes it. And, and at, the, at that moment, suddenly I'm in a position where I can buy my groceries and I can buy my clothes and I can buy my... Um, housing, I can buy everything with Bitcoin. Once I can buy everything with Bitcoin, why do I want a currency that's tied to a, a government that is subject to political whims? I know that they always inflate, whether it's 3% as it was in the last decade or 10% as it will be in the next decade, we're going to get inflation, whereas there's no inflation with Bitcoin. So I'm going to hold my Bitcoin. People say, when are you going to sell your Bitcoin? I always say, into what? This is like taking the current, that would be like taking the currency of the present and the future and exchanging it for the currency of the past. It's like taking your, your dollars and, and converting them to Confederate dollars. You know, they used to print Confederate dollars like crazy. Or taking your euros and converting them to French francs or or Greek drachma. Um, this is this is a new movement, and uh, and it's coming, and it keeps getting better. And there are more and more people involved in it, and more and more people using it for whatever vehicle through the financial community. It's also affecting how we how we think about assets, how we um, think about uh, contracts. All those things are changing. So, sorry, I've taken a long time. Um, Michael, tell me more. I, I'm interested in your third part, the digital energy of money. Is it that you think that there are going to be more transactions than there ever were, so we all get wealthier because of these quick transactions? And that, as a result, would mean that we would have a lot more uses for Bitcoin, or, uh, or is it something else? Well, I'm, um, you know, as I, as I look at the next stage, I'm, I'm seeing 8 billion people on the planet and they'll all have a mobile device or, or several, mm -hmm. and they'll all have a wallet with a, with, I think a digital currency and a digital asset. And I think the digital asset, the, the strongest digital asset will be Bitcoin. And I think that in the next decade, most currencies will fail, but the strongest currencies will be like a digital dollar and a digital yuan and a digital euro. And we'll go from uh, 200 currencies to 100 currencies to 50 currencies to 25 currencies. And eventually you'll just have the top dozen or two dozen. Um, if I suppose at some point we could get to the, to the point where we don't have any of those currencies, but I think that there'll be some governmental entity or some kind of quasi official entity that'll always want to issue some derivative security type currency. And I think that uh, Bitcoin is like the primary reserve asset. So it backs it. And, uh, you know, I kind of think of it as savings account and checking account, right? You're, you're saving your working capital and digital dollars. You have a month of working capital and then you're saving your life savings and the assets. And ultimately they'll be jockeying about whether or not I want to hold assets that represent companies or assets that represent art or assets that represent other rights. But we, I mean, digital, you know, Bitcoin represents to me pure monetary energy 
but money is energy. Money is social, political energy. And, uh, and so you could think of it as just pure digital energy. Um, if I had a megawatt of power and I wanted to hold it a hundred years and move it around the globe a hundred times, I would have nothing left because it would be dissipated every time I moved it. And you lose 2% of the power in a battery every month if you're lucky enough to be able to store it. So I can't store the energy that way, but if I convert it into Bitcoin, I can store it mm. just like a vacuum, vacuum sealed <clears throat> food or just like something sitting in orbit, no friction, no decomposition. And uh, so I, I agree with you that I think that all the borders come down. The, th the thing that's magical about, about Bitcoin is, is Bitcoin's an asset, it's a technology and it's a protocol. And as an asset, if you think of it as digital property or digital energy or digital money, because they're all, they're all comparable for practical purposes. If you think of it that way, then it gives, you, it gives you a higher form of property right than we've ever had from anything else. If I, if I have a building in Vegas and I'm a rich person, I can own the building. And then I can put a lien on the building, I can mortgage the building, I can sell the building, I can lease the building, and I can improve the building. But if I'm a middle class person, oh, by the way, I can't move the building. But if I'm a middle class person, I can only buy a share in a REIT, which is a security. So I can buy one one thousandth of the building, but I own a security. And, so, and rights in a security are much weaker than rights in the property itself. It's not practical for a normal person to buy the property. You can't buy one twenty seventh of the building every day and you can't trade out of it. So when I actually start trading the securities, I lose my rights to lean it, to develop it, to mortgage it, and I'm impaired. The significance of Bitcoin is I can have digital property with all the property rights. I can lean it. I can... I can contribute it to someone else's business venture subject to conditions, a smart contract. That's like a lien. I can borrow against it for a decade. That's a mortgage. I can sell it, but I, can, but I have the option to sell it to anybody on earth. And so I, I feel like when you start to think about digital property and you think about moving it at the speed of light and vibrating at 60 megahertz and using a computer to do a million transactions an hour on it, you almost, you almost break the, the metaphor of property because people can't imagine decomposing a building magically a million times an hour. So they, they can't get that through their head. But the thing that allows your multinational future to take place is the fact that anybody in Vegas can trade one 937th of a building with someone in Nigeria and they can do it on a Saturday afternoon. And they're and their phone can do it with the other person's phone while they're sleeping. And so the idea, the idea of, of being able to move value so fluidly kind of breaks most of our economic models. And I, it's magical in a sense. And, uh, and what do you get? Well, you've got Bitcoin is a trust network for 8 billion people, you're correct. Bitcoin is a monetary network for 8 billion people. Bitcoin is an energy network. Bitcoin is a, is a way for you to store energy and suck it out somewhere else in the world a, th a thousand years from now with no power loss. Or to your point, I mean, one thing you say is like, you don't want to sell your Bitcoin. I agree. As the Bitcoin banking industry evolves, if I have 10 kids, I could give each kid a trust with one Bitcoin each. And then I could generate yield off the Bitcoin and I could just set it up so that they can never sell the Bitcoin. And that passes from generation to generation and they're living off of the pure energy. You can expect it to appreciate. And there's going to be so much demand by people to borrow it that they'll pay you a yield on the borrow of the asset, which is it's it's the same as I rent, I, I leased the building to the highest renter. But the difference is I can only lease a building in Vegas to someone that wants a building in Vegas. But if I have a billion dollars of monetary energy in Vegas, I can lease it 
to anybody anywhere in the world that wants a billion dollars of monetary energy. And I'll probably end up leasing it to someone like a Facebook or a Twitter or a Google or an Apple or, or the cyber bank of the 22nd century because they're going to want the asset for whatever financial insurance instrument or whatever digital instrument they come up with. And so the result is, I think, I think you start thinking differently about money and you think differently about property and you think differently about energy when you're able to create digital energy, right? It, it's a way to move things across time and space at a frequency uh, unfathomable and without friction. It's superconducting. And uh, I, I think it's obviously massively productivity inducing. And it represents a crystallization of the civilization. Just like, you know, when, when you have a heated, you know, you have steam and it collapses to water, you give off energy. And when the water collapses to ice, you give off more energy. I think that we're, we have a very inefficient set of capital structures. We, we use $100 trillion of credit on the balance sheets of companies. And that credit is extremely inefficient way to store monetary energy. And if that hundred trillion dollars of credit flows into Bitcoin, you will, the theoretical negative real yield on credit is like minus 15% a year right now, if you take the monetary inflation rate. So imagine a hundred trillion dollars losing 15% a year and then flipping it into some crypto structure like Bitcoin, which doesn't lose 15% a year. That excess energy becomes productivity in the civilization and that is what pays for your children and your children's children and future generations to do whatever they want or to achieve whatever they want. Yeah, I, I love that. The, the, uh, I've always felt that an increase, I mean, this is true, the increase in liquidity throughout the world will increase the wealth throughout the world and and that will grow. And if it's tied to, I mean, that, that was kind of fun to think about, which is the, the idea that um, I can store value up there without having the <clears throat> electrical signals running around the earth. It can be stored there indefinitely. I can hold on to it and only use it as I need it. Um, and that will, uh, and, and trading that for energy, money, energy. Putting energy in orbit. Time. Yeah, it's kind of a fun fun way for at least for me to think about this. Um, yeah, the other um, thing you brought up were the other currencies, and um, and people say, well, wait, aren't you a Bitcoin, uh, whatever they call it, a Bitcoin optimist or whatever? But um, but I'm I'm not. I'm I'm looking at this the way I used to look at uh, the internet. Or, or software, um, where Bitcoin is kind of the Microsoft and Microsoft created this platform. And then all these people built these software packages on, tr on top of Microsoft's operating system. And then Microsoft one by one just picked off the ones that mattered. <laughs> and they instead, they saw Lotus one, two, three succeeding. So they created Excel, they saw Word perfect succeeding, so they created Word. They did a database. They did a, a number, and and so then they kind of dominated the entire um, industry. And I suspect that's kind of what Bitcoin is doing here, because you'll end up um, you 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 see a bunch of funny things happening out there, and then you you start to realize that okay, let's. Let's see, Bitcoin should take on NFTs. They should take on DeFi. Um, they should uh, get involved in smart contracts and that kind of thing. And, and then Bitcoin becomes the dominant supplier. And, and so when people uh, say, what about all these other currencies? I'm always thinking, well, long term, I'm always thinking, what's going to happen long term? Um, there will probably be other currencies. And you said they'll go from... A, 3,000 to 100 to 50 to 20. And that's probably right because there, a lot of these currencies have come up with areas where they're going to be 
uh, they're going to have these um, specialties and those specialties will be very strong for them and they won't be important enough for a Bitcoin programmer to add to the Bitcoin ecosystem. But um, I am less optimistic that people will want to hold on to dollar or, or uh, even digital dollars or digi digital yuan in the future. Although I do believe governments will want to promote them. I don't believe that the people will bite. Um, I actually think that at one point, there will be a point at which I am, you know, if, if I'm a, a woman, I am controlling 80% of the spending and and I look and the retailer is giving me a discount using Bitcoin and I can buy all my food, clothing, shelter through Bitcoin. I'm going to say, why are we holding any of these dollars? And knowing that the dollar is going to continue, people ask me, well, what about, what about the volatility of Bitcoin? And I say, well, yeah, um, you know, one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. It's just all these other currencies are very volatile as they slowly disappear from use. And I think that that is what that, um, the woman who's controlling 80% of the spending is going to start thinking. They're going to say, wait, why do we hold any of these dollars? They, it, it costs so many more of them to buy our food, our groceries, our clothes than it does than it used to. And, uh, and so why aren't we just holding all of our money in Bitcoin? And that will be the decision of the family. And I think it will be the future. Um, wh what do you think of the, and I do believe, I love all the alternative currencies because they'll come up with all sorts of new things. Tezos is a new way of governing, you know, Aragon, new way of, uh, creating a judicial system and a voting system. A lot of interesting things happening out there. Um, but I think it eventually it does centralize around Bitcoin. Um, what, what do you think of these alternatives and where do you think they will go? Well, I mean, I, first of all, one thing we agree on is Bitcoin is like an operating system for energy and an operating system for money. But the difference between Bitcoin and Microsoft is Microsoft is a company that did steal a lot of people's ideas that they don't trust, and they did it for the benefit of Microsoft shareholders. Bitcoin's not a company, and there's no CEO of Bitcoin trying to figure out how to steal everybody's applications or build them into the Bitcoin operating system. And I think actually the appeal of Bitcoin is that there is, there is no intention to functionality other than to be Bitcoin. I think most of the innovation, if not the great almost all of it will be on layer two, layer three, layer four applications that'll, and the beneficiaries will be the companies and the individuals and the organizations that actually pursue those innovations. And the reason people trust Bitcoin is because they can trust Bitcoin because they don't think Bitcoin's gonna steal their stuff. Um, so I think that there'll be a massive set of innovation above the base layer um, when I talked about currencies, I really was referring to U.S. dollar and euro currencies. I think as long as the U.S. government exists, there'll be a U.S. dollar. I think that the Venezuelan bolivar is going to fade. But as long as there's a Venezuelan government that forces you to pay taxes in Venezuelan bolivars, then I think it's really not a question of does it exist, but it's a question of how long do you hold it in your wallet and how, how much value is in the bolivar. So, if there's a hundred, if you if you're holding the bolivar and you and you've got a gun to your head, you're going to actually pay your taxes in bolivars. You're going to hold it for a day or an hour or a minute, and then I think when you talk to Venezuelans, they will convert their working capital into USD because they want to buy from retailers outside of Venezuela that want dollars, but they're not going to save them for hold them for a decade. They're going to hold USD for a month or for a week. And if you want to hold something for a decade, right, it's really a question of do you want to hold your money for 100 years or for a year or for a month or for a minute? <laughs> and maybe at the, at the end of the day, if you said, well, I'm going to actually keep the dollar, but I'm only going to hold my money in the dollar for a minute, that's not different than what you just said. 
which is people aren't going to really use the dollar. But maybe it's a, a distinction without a difference. At the end of the day, if 99% of the money flows into an asset like Bitcoin, then maybe 99% of the currency is Bitcoin. But you could still have a CNY and you could still, if the Chinese government says you can't use it and you can't have it in your digital wallet, then they're going to keep you from being able to use it. And they can force value. If I put a gun to your head, I can force you to put your value into my local currency until the currency collapses and then you've got Stone Age barter. And that kind of happened before Bitcoin, right? Like in Argentina and Zimbabwe. So I think in a pre-crypto economy and, and a pre-mobile economy, then you have hyperinflation and collapse. I don't think the people will go down without a fight in the mobile economy. I think if you're in Afghanistan or Lebanon today, you're scrambling around trying to figure out how to get a crypto asset into a digital wallet. And I, I think there'll be competition for fiat currencies. I, I think we'll go again. Well, the U.S. dollar is replacing the bolivar and the peso and the lira I mean, and, and the Afghan currency. There's competition at the fiat level. And I think there's also technical competition. And, you know, out of the 6,000 cryptocurrencies, there'll be a massive shakeout. And if there's a few cryptocurrencies that do something unique and different that the market values, then they'll live. And the Me Too's that are poorly engineered or not differentiated get squeezed out. And then I think we've got this entire, entire rest of the world, which is what else can I do? I, I still need food. I still need transport. I still need shelter. I still need services. We could tokenize all that either in the form of rights and tickets or stocks. And I think there'll be a place for that. And maybe the, you know, that that's what makes the entire economy interesting for the next 10 to 20 years, because there's a lot of business opportunity in, in making all this stuff work. But I think if you, if you want to take away, at least my takeaway is if I'm a country, I want to own Bitcoin. If I'm a company, I want my treasury in Bitcoin. If I'm a family, I want my treasury in Bitcoin. And if I have a product or a service, I want to figure out the most rational way to build Bitcoin into it, either using Bitcoin itself or using the lightning layer or doing a proprietary application mm -hmm. on top of Bitcoin. Because ultimately, Bitcoin is the most stable, most trustworthy thing in the economic universe going forward. And I think the winners are the countries, the corporations, and the products, and the families that, um, that uh, integrate with it most effectively and most deeply. So it was one thing to say, I like Bitcoin, but I have $100 billion of US dollars. It's another thing to say, I'm just going to buy $100 billion worth of Bitcoin, and you can have whatever opinion you want about Bitcoin. I, I really think that this is a time for action, not just, uh, not just speculation. And those that move aggressively will win, and those that don't move aggressively will suffer. They'll struggle. Well, thank you, Michael. This is great. I'm glad we, um, that we had this talk, and thank you to the LA Blockchain Summit. Uh, for bringing us together. That was fun and fascinating. And uh, I'm sorry we, we have no more time. But, um, you know, that was great. You mentioned the Lightning Network. We have a company, OpenNode, that, uh, that uh, is allowing the retailer to take that Bitcoin. And so once that happens, boy, it, there really won't be a lot of reasons to hold on to anything but uh, Bitcoin. Exciting so, times. Yeah, nice, nice to do this with you today, Tim. Yeah, you bet. We'll we'll do it again sometime.